Tonight, we are absolutely delighted, finally, to welcome back Leila Slimani to, to speak with you this evening and to, at the British Library. Um, and it's, it's been some time, I think, and, but we're absolutely thrilled and here, here to talk about her latest novel and many other things besides the latest novel, of course, being Watch Us Dance. Uh, copies of the book are over in the shop just downstairs along with some, with some of uh, Leila's other titles as well. So please do take this opportunity to get one and have it signed later on. And those watching online, just go to the books tab at the top of your screen. So our speaker tonight, joining, of course, Bonnie Greer, who I'll introduce in a second, is, of course, Leila Slimani, who is uh, the first Moroccan woman to win France's most prestigious literary prize, Prix Goncourt, which she won for Lullaby, which um, um, you know, shot her to fame alongside her, the other titles um, that she came out around that time. Her other books, Adele, Sex and Lies, In the Country of Others, and now Watch Us Dance, and, of course, a new fiction, non-fiction work recently came out, the scent of flowers at night. Uh, Leila is also a journalist and a frequent commentator on women's and human rights. She is also chair of the International Booker Prize 2023 judges recently. Uh, she was born in Rabat in Morocco and now lives in Portugal. So that's Leila. Uh, joining her, and I'm absolutely thrilled also to have with us tonight Bonnie Greer, who's a good friend of the libraries and has done many things for us over the years. Uh, Bonnie is a, an American British playwright, a novelist, critic, and broadcaster. She was born in Chicago and began writing plays at the age of nine, later studying theatre in Chicago under David Mamet and in New York, and then moved to London and Britain, at least in 1986, and where she has become a frequent commentator on radio and television and serves on the boards of several leading arts organisations. She has published many books and novels, including biography of the writer and social activist Langston Hughes, and explorations of the lives of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Marilyn Monroe, and Ella Fitzgerald, and her own memoir, Parallel Life. So that's who we have with us tonight. They're going to have a great conversation, and um, thank you for being here once again. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I mean, sort of like outside, but anyway, you're here. And um, Leila and I, I I have to say Leela and I, in a sense, because the links that we have are just like really spooky. Um, her name is the same name as my grandmother and my sister, and her mom and me were born on the same day in the same year, so it's like really like, you know. Um, what I want to do this evening in the time that we have is I don't want to give you a book review or a plot thing or anything. If you want to know what the books, her novel's about, and I think this is always a truism. You should just buy it. And um, also, there are things online if you need to know the plots. I'm not going to go do any plots. I, I want to have a conversation and a conversation with you about, I guess, the essence of the, of the novels, the novel process itself, Morocco, you. And, um, and we'll have plenty of time to have questions from you or comments and thoughts. So I've got a lot of notes. I'm going to hold them up to my face like this, and I'm going to start. Layla. Layla or Leela? Because my grandmother was Leela. Layla. Layla, okay. Um, these two incredibly fine novels, beautiful novels, contain biographical elements. Um, does fiction give you more ability to do that? Because you've got enough facts to write something else. Does fiction give you a space? Yes, of course. You know, I define myself really as a, a novelist and a novelist of fiction. I'm obsessed with fiction, but it's an obsession that comes from very, very far away. As a child, I have to say that uh, it was very difficult for me when I was a child to make a difference between fiction and reality. So you would say that I was a big liar, which is not completely untrue. But it was not just about lying. I was able, you know, when I was watching a movie, I, I felt I was in the movie. When I was reading a book, I was in the book. And then it was very difficult for me to come back into my reality. And I think that the different characters in my family were, of course, real. My grandmother was my grandmother, but she was also, in my head, as a little girl, she was also the character of a novel 
for me. And because she was a great storyteller and because she told me uh, about her childhood, about her youth, about her love story with my father, with great details, the dress she was wearing and the, the little cafe where they met and all of this, I had this movie in my, in my head. So I, I really think actually that we never really know people. We meet people and then we tell ourselves a story about those people we are meeting. Or even about yourself. Yeah, so yeah. I don't really believe that anything is real. Everything is fiction. Even, even ourself, um, when you tell a story about yourself to someone or you tell a, a memory, a souvenir, it's a story you told yourself. But is it totally true? Maybe if you ask your brother or your sister to tell about this memory, he will tell a very different story. So nations are even, even fictional? Of course, there is what we call in France le récit national, the big national narrative that we all have about a nation, but it's a fiction. You know, this idea of France, like the country of liberty, uh, I can tell you that from a point of view of an African, the narrative is probably not the same. It's not just a country of liberty, but it's, yeah, it depends on the point of view and who is talking. The, your writing is, it's very difficult to do this, but anyway, we'll try, because <laughs> we've got a lot of distraction. Your, your writing is very physical, and that's the thing that strikes me almost more than anything else. I call it crunchy. And I don't want to say for a woman, because that's BS, but it's, it's very physical. And is, I'm going to make a leap here. Is that possibly because of your, the, your, your medical background in your family or because of you? And is it, is it, is it a quality of you? But it strikes me as a, the physicalness of it is amazing. I think, yes, it has to do with the medical background. So my mother was a doctor as her brother, her sister, and the people they married. So they were all doctors. So for, I remember when I was a child, the Christmas dinner, it was all about, oh, yesterday I did a surgery with that, and they were all, you know, sharing medical experience, and sometimes it was really shocking. So you had to go there. You had yeah, to go exactly. There. So, and I was not afraid of, of the body. I remember when, when, I was, when I was a kid, when we killed the, the sheep for the... Um, the Eid al-Kabir for the, the Muslim, Muslim ritual. My mother, she used to take the body of the, of the animal and to show us this is the heart, this is an artery, this is how the blood is going. She used to take water to show us. So I was... How young were you when this happened? Maybe eight, seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And I was at the same time very impressed and fascinated by how beautiful and magical the, the body was. And I was not afraid. But it has also to do, I think, my obsession with the body, with the fact that I was raised in a very patriarchal country where women don't own the, their own body. But you why did you go the other way? You see, see that's interesting because, you're, you're, of course, you're right. And the way that maybe a lot of people would have gone was to not go there. I mean, you talk about, you talk about the vagina. You talk about being inside the vagina. You talk about uh, what a man feels like being inside of a woman, what the back of a woman's neck is like, what is happening on a woman's feet. I mean, there's a scene, there's a moment where you talk about, and I've never ever seen this before in my life, this woman takes the hijab off and her hair comes down to her back and it's full of knits and that, you know, and you think, oh, whoa, and you, and you enter a man's consciousness, the male consciousness, in a very physical, physical way, which is interesting to me, it's very interesting. And so now I sort of understand the imperative that your fiction drives you to do that. Exactly, and um, because everything that was related to the body was shameful, was forbidden, was dirty, and we were not allowed to speak about that because, you know, in Morocco, um, sexual intercourse outside marriage is forbidden and a woman is supposed to be a virgin or a married woman. 
And you're not supposed to speak about your body, you're not supposed to show your body, but at the same time, when women are together alone and there, is, there are no men, we speak about that all the time. We speak so you've about, outed yeah, all that, basically. Yeah, of course. And I wanted to, and also I think maybe I wanted to shock or to provoke, uh, I want to speak about this thing because I think it's beautiful and I think it's very significant. And uh, sometimes you can tell a lot about someone just by describing his hand or describing his face or the way he touches his hair. But, you know, I think, I think you're right. I think what I want to sort of tease out is it, it seems to me in your fiction there's a need to do that. It's not, it's not you are describing anything. Yeah. That in and of itself is what the fiction is. That moment when two people are looking at each other. I, it, it sort of was when... Um, when the main character, and forgive me because these names, but the, the main character looks at her, her husband for the first time and to actually say what she's feeling. And you know that people feel that way, but to, you've actually boom, 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 described her physical feeling toward him and what it felt like and his physical feeling toward her, which seems to be very integral to your fiction, very integral to the novels, both of them. But I think it has to do also with the fact that I feel my body all the time and I'm always listening to it. I feel, sometimes I feel ashamed, I feel uncomfortable. I feel a lot of things through my, my body. And I remember when I met my publisher, uh, one day I was writing a novel and he asked me, so where are you in the novel? Can you tell me about the story? So I told him, so you know, so I have this character, he has very big feet and uh, he has, and he was like, I don't care about the feet of your character, why are you telling me this? And I was like, it's very important, I can't understand a character until I have the body of the character. If he's very thin, if he's very slim, if he's, he can't see or if he has a lot of headaches, it's going to influence its personality. So I always, always begin with the body of my character before the personality before the soul and all of this so this kind of breaks the in its own way the kind of taboo in the culture about talking about bodies especially female and bodies. the sociology yes. because I hate the fact that I think many many French novels are a lot about sociology you are first defined by your position your class uh, your social class or your gender or your color and I wanted to do something else to define people first as because I feel like an animal I'm an animal when I'm hungry I'm really hungry when I want to have sex I want to have sex when I'm I want to sleep I want to sleep and I think that's those those are very, very strong feelings. But at the same time, in literature, very often we despise this. It's just impulse, it's just animal things. But I don't think so. I think it's very, very important. It defines us. So I want my characters to be animals. It's incredible because the first novel um, is the, um, I can get everyone's name, I think it's Aicha, is looking at her friend in the chapel and she's in a church, and she's looking at the back of her neck. And, and I was brought up Roman Catholic, and that's the last thing I would have been doing at mass. And I went to a girl's school, was looking at one of my classmates' necks. But she does, and she looks at the blonde hair on her neck, and you describe it so specifically, so minutely, so uh, painstakingly, that it gives us the idea of who this girl is. And of course she becomes a doctor. I mean, you don't know at that point what she's going to be, but then she becomes a doctor. And I, I find that quite, that, that's amazing. In the second novel is called, uh, of the trilogy, is called Watch Us Dance. And I thought, yes, now knowing how you write, I thought to myself, yes, watch us dance on the head of a pen, watch us dance at the end of a rope. You know, watch us dance through this revolution but also it takes place in 68. And those of you old enough to remember 68, you know that we thought that France was on the verge of revolution. We thought this was it, it was going to happen. And I remember the pictures of the, of the, of the girls as Marianne, you know, standing on the shoulders of the boys being taken through the various plazas in Paris. And, and de Gaulle thought Paris was gonna go too. I mean, he thought France was gonna fall too, he resigned. So, the, so 68 becomes a very important 
touchstone in the second novel. How did you discover 68 for yourself? I discovered it through my parents because my, my mother, she was in Strasbourg and then in Paris during May 68. And my father was a communist. The surname of my father was Karl Marx. Everyone used to call my father Karl Marx. And he was like a revolutionary with big hair and a big beard. And I was very interested in this period because when I asked my parents about their those years, they always told me we were dancing. It was beautiful. And we had so much hopes and so much dreams. And we thought that the world was going to change. We believed in sexual revolution. We believed in equality between men and women. We believed also in the fact that the third world was going to to emerge. And we and called to, it the third yeah, world. Yeah, the third yes, world. Yes. It's a thing that we don't yes. use today, but the third world was going to emerge. And all this, all the, those dreams for my generation are broken dreams. And all the, those ideals were betrayed, actually, after by, by this generation. Because my father was called Karl Marx, but then he became a banker and exactly. had a big Mercedes. So it was not quite Karl Marx. So I, I think I wanted to write this book to understand why my parents betrayed their ideals, but also to understand myself, because I'm at the age where I know also that I betrayed my own ideals. I am 42 years old, and when I look at myself in the mirror, I know that I'm not the woman I thought I was going to be when I was 20 years old, because when I was 20 you years old... You have plenty of time later. Yeah. You, but don't worry. But you <laughs> you know, can do it. You know, it, it's it's... This novel, um, you have one moment that really actually made me laugh early in the novel, but also I thought, how did she know this? Um, where, um, get everyone's name right, Aicha, who was the daughter, is the daughter of Mathilde, who was born, it was Alsacian, and her, and, and uh, Amin, the Moroccan father. So she's in two worlds. She looks like her mother, as does her brother, in this Morocco. And she goes, she goes to university in Strasbourg, yes? And there is a scene in the second book that actually made me laugh. And I thought, how the hell does she know? She's going into the hairdresser because she wants to look like Francoise Hardy. Now, any of you who are old enough to know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you have to laugh. I mean, it's, it's amazing that she's going in there to get her hair ironed, all of this. And then she returns to Morocco and she doesn't recognize the look on her father's face when she comes off the plane because she is a French girl, basically, who's coming back home. And these little tiny little clashes, these little minute little culture clashes that you have are exquisite, actually. Very good. But you know, my mother, she had hair like me, very big hair like this in, in 19... In the, in the 60s, before um, black power and black is beautiful mm -hmm. and all this, in France especially, people would not wear the hair like this. And Ironing my mother, hair. she tried everything. She even ironed her own hair, you know, and she, of course, she burned her, her face. And um, this book is a lot about hair also. There yes, are a is. lot of, of stories about hair because just wearing those hair, it's not insignificant. And I remember even when I arrived in France 20, two years ago, when I was walking in the street, I could see that people see me. And sometimes you don't want to be seen, you want to be invisible, but people, they look at you, people touch your hair, people ask you, is it natural? And I'm like, do you really think that in the morning I do mm. something to have mm. this hair? Mm. So it's something that makes you very visible. And in France, when they people design people who are black or from Maghreb, they say visible minority. And I think it's very violent, this idea that you are visible, that you don't have the right to be invisible. Also, you're constantly in defense. Exactly. You're constantly in defense mode. You know, you have to defend yourself because you're a visible minority. It's, it's interesting about hair. I mean, I live in Soho, and I'm looking at women, young women all the time in their 20s, I don't know what's, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to me to watch. I mean, I know this is about fashion. So everyone's got their hair parted in the middle and it's all going down like this. And I can see the work 
that some women have to do in order to, women have always worked. I mean, yeah. this is not anything new. But it's so interesting to me to watch the work that women who don't have hair like this naturally, it's enormous amount of work. And to get your hair like enough this. Enough time and yeah, enough and the suffering. Time, and enough. you have to part your hair like this and you're buying things. And you sort of sum it up in, a, in that one sentence. She wanted to look like Francoise Hardy. And anybody knows what I'm talking about, should Google. But it's, it's, it's an interesting moment. And it's also the fact that we didn't have any models to identify to. When I was young, so in the 90s, uh, I remember it was the time of the big models. It was Claudia Schiffer, Cindy Crawford, oh, voila, and all voila, this. Voila. And the supermodels. Yeah, the supermodels. and I used to hate them, to hate them so much. Uh, I wanted to kill Claudia Schiffer. I was dreaming of her, and I hated her because I was like, it's impossible for a girl like me. I will never be considered beautiful in, in this world. And, uh, you know, at that time, you would never see a girl in a magazine with my hair. You would never see See an Arab girl, you would never see a girl with big eyebrows like like me. So yeah, I, I hated uh, Claudia Schiffer for many many years. This is very very interesting because in the 70s, for a second it existed, a second, and then it changed. Yeah, it went back. It went to everything else. Um, this second novel feels faster. It feels more urgent than the first. Um, it it has more of a sort of energy, I mean, we, the, the children have grown up, they're starting to find their sexuality, they're starting to find what they, who they are, what they are. The farm is, is a business now. Uh, there is the revolution, or not. There's something has happened. And the novel, the second installment feels more urgent, as if in the first one you were laying out the lay of the land, the territory. The second one has an incredible sort of urgency and the second generation picks it up. But it has to do with the period of time also. In the 60s, everything is changing. The world is totally changing and Morocco is entering into modernity. In the first one, it's the end of an era. It's something declining very slowly. Uh, it's the end of colonization. It's the end of a certain eternal Morocco, so that's why also it's very slow. And it was important for me to, to, to put, yeah, to be in the rhythm of every period and to show that for my grandmother when she arrived in Morocco, she arrived in Morocco at the end of the, of the 40s, it was a, a country that hasn't changed for centuries. The, the type of organization, the way of life, the, the relationship between men and women, between big cities and the countryside, it hasn't changed for really for centuries. And when French arrived, everything changed in like 10 or 20 years. So I wanted to show this shock between a, a country that has a multi-secular organization and the beginning of modernization. And her daughter takes up medicine, her daughter. Uh, but her son, her son and, and I mean son, seem to hold another side of both of them that you reveal in the first novel, their meeting, how they came together. The father was a prisoner of war in a German POW camp. She was a young French girl in Alsace. She goes to live with him. Uh, then she realizes that the family back home may be doing some machinations with the, with the with the inheritance. The son seems to hold those contradictions in himself, especially with his, I guess you'd call his affair with his auntie. I mean, this, 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 he holds all of this contradiction. Yeah, and also I think he suffers a lot of being a, a boy, of being the son, because he comes, he lives in a very, very patriarchal country, Morocco at that time. It's God, the king, the military, your father, the son. You know, in Morocco, when someone asks you um, who you are, he doesn't ask you your name or who are you. He, the first question is always, who is your father? You have to define yourself 
um, in, yeah, through your father, the identity of your family. And I think that Selim, he's only 18 years old, and he feels this pressure of he being, looks different from yeah, everyone, yes. of being a son, and he doesn't want to have the same life as his father. He doesn't want to be a farmer. He doesn't want to work uh, all day and to work so hard. He doesn't want this life. But at that time in Morocco, a son was not supposed to express his desire. You, you, you were not supposed to have any individual desire. You do what you have to do. You inherit from the farm and you become a farmer and your son is, always, is also becoming a farmer. So I think that it's very difficult for him to, yeah, to protest or to re, re, be rebellious against his father and to refuse to inherit this farm. So that's why one day he meets with a girl. She's a hippie, she's a Danish girl in Morocco because at the end of the 60s, a lot of Americans, especially Americans fleeing from Vietnam who didn't want to go to Vietnam. It was Vietnam. the hippie trail. Yeah. It was totally the and hippie And the hippie trail. trail went to Spain, Ibiza, and then Tangier, That's and right. then Essaouira. Yeah. And my parents, they spent some time with them in Essaouira, so they told me it was completely crazy. They yeah. lived yeah. on the beach yep. all together. They're high all the time. It, yep. yeah, yeah, exactly. Many nationalities, and they were really, really fascinated by Moroccan music. Yes. And so a lot of artists and musicians came and they mixed between Moroccan music and American music and Jimi Hendrix came. Yep. And so I, I tell the story of this very famous night where Jimi Hendrix came in Essaouira and yep. spent a whole night with the, the hippies on the beach. And that whole idea of Morocco, for my generation, uh, Morocco was the hippie trail. I mean, we, you know, we knew there was something going on, but what was really going on was that. And, and just to speak about Africa itself, I mean, I always tell people, especially young people, talk about Africa. Well, I say, you know, it's not a country. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's not this place that you think, uh, you know, this tiny place where whatever. <laughs> Yet, this idea of Africa, of Algeria, I have a very close friend who's Algerian. He's an African. You're an African. So it's this expansion of Africa. Also in the novel, I noticed the black Africans were called darkies. And you know, all of this kind of multi-layered sort of shape yeah. where Moroccans could be Africans in the way we understand Africa in, in that way. And they could be something else as well. And that sort of dual thing that comes into Morocco. You know, in Morocco, we have a very famous expression saying that Morocco is a tree with the roots in Africa and the leaves in Europe. Yes. So we are like between two continents, between two uh, vision of the world, between yeah, two civilization. But I think also that through my books and um, I think that a lot of my African writers friends would share this with me, we fight for singularity. I mean, Morocco is not Algeria, Algeria is not Tunisia, and Senegal is not Ivory Coast, and I think it's very important. You know, when I was a child raised in Morocco, I learned uh, French, and I wrote, uh, and I read a lot of French books, and English books, and American books, and I knew a lot about the Western world when I arrived here. And I was really surprised that people I met in, in France or in London or whatever knew so few about me, about Morocco. If you ask someone in the streets in Morocco what is the capital of France and who is the, what is the name of the president and what, they will know. If you ask the same question in, in Paris, who is the prime minister in Morocco, do you know the capital? People, they, they won't know because they don't care. It's not important because for many, many, many years, for centuries, there was this idea that the important and universal culture is the Europe European culture and American culture. Yes, and American to, to add. And, and one of my sort of things is that I think particularly black America, my country, my region of, of think, you know, thinking, has had a really inordinately strong influence on the whole of Africa and the Caribbean as well. So that what you get is 
a tunnel through which exactly. a lot of things are looked at through black America. I call it black America. L very long tunnel of our own story, our own grievances, our own joys, our own triumphs. So that in a sense, um, the rest of the view is reduced, not even consciously, but it gets smaller and smaller as it goes through this tunnel of black American thought, uh, writing, speaking, and it's interesting because I'm glad that you cited or you quoted Glissant, Edouard Glissant, in The Poetics of Relation. And I don't know if any of you, well, I'm sure most of you know the work of Glissant. Incredible uh, precision in terms of looking at the multilinearity of, let's say, the black world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I consider myself being a descendant of the slave ship. I don't even look at Africa anymore. I don't know where I came from in Africa. I mean, I've taken DNA tests. They don't know either. So I'm, I'm looking at the boat. And he looks at the boat. And you, in the, your novels, also look at this multilinearity of Africa. Of course. And I don't believe in, when you come from Africa, you, you know that you have been influenced by so many cultures that you, things are very mixed. I don't believe in purity. Uh, I don't, not, not only I don't believe in it, but I'm afraid by anyone who would defend so any kind, so. yeah, so any so. kind of purity. And I'm very afraid today if about, by what is happening today in Europe and by this idea that Europe would be replaced by the, the immigrants and that we should fight against the loss of European civilization. I think that every civilization is made of mixing people and culture and languages and colors and skins. And that's something that I'm trying to defend also in my writing, the, the idea that nothing is pure. Not, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, exactly. And yeah. The, the story of this family is that it's a family where nothing is pure, not only yeah, in terms of culture and identity, but even in terms of feeling, nothing is pure. Uh, someone like the character of Mehdi, he wants to be a revolutionary and he wants to be a communist, but he wants to have money also and to have a big house. Nothing is pure in the human condition. Everything is full of, of contradiction. If, if someone comes to you and tell you, you know, I'm totally pure, be, <laughs> be very careful because this person is probably very dangerous. And you know who talked about that yeah, a lot. Exactly. So we won't go yeah. there, but um, that is sort of the credo that's happening in the United States, this notion of, they call it the great replacement Exactly, theory. in France and it's that, the same. Yeah, and, the, and that is what's happening. You know, in your novels, there's a lot of shit in it. I mean, you like that. I mean, people have it on their feet. You talk about it in their... So that's interesting to me. Does it have a... I'm not going to use the word representative quality. Does it have a quality that, that has something to do with the presenting of a real thing or a real life or, or something? It, it's, it's a, it, it, you talk about it on people's feet. You talk about it in, you know, happening to people. You talk about it in relation to women. And it's, that is so interesting to me. You know, I don't really an analyze my work, and I have to say also that uh, I'm not very, very conscious when I write. It's much more my unconsciousness that works. And I think it's something very important when you are an artist. And for creativity, it's very important to accept the idea that sometimes you don't really understand what you do, and you sometimes. don't really know where you, you are going. I was talking yesterday with someone at the Hay Festival and he said that writing is like driving in, in the night, you know, and you can only see like five meters away, but you don't, you know where you are going. But, but there's a moment when, I mean, you can write in your head. There's a moment when you set it to paper. So there's a decision that's been made. I mean, the, even if it's an unconscious decision and that, I mean, a lot of uh, both of your novels have a very surprising sort of twists like that. Mm. You go, you're going down one avenue, and suddenly there is this sort of detour where you see a woman, you see defecation, or you see a woman, or 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 lice coming out of a woman's hair, or you know this kind, these kind of things, and you and you and you turn 
and there they are. Maybe because also I hate the idea that women should always be glamorous and that everything that goes with the body of women should be beautiful, erotic, and uh, that women are, is an object of desire. Yeah, of course, a woman is also can also be dirty and she can also be defecating and she can also have this kind of experience. So I think, yeah, maybe I'm, I don't want to yeah, to be too glamorous when I, when I describe women or people in general. It's good, it's good, because it, you don't expect it. And that's the good part about it. It's something, a story goes along and then bang, bang, bang. What do you think compels a writer to explore the terrain that they do? You know, I don't know, I don't know. I think that we have obsessions if I reread all my books, I could find some obsessions that I have, but the truth is, I don't really want to know. Um, lately, I read one or two theses written about my work, because now there are students uh, like studying my work. And when I read it, I was like, but that's not this at all. That's not what I wanted to, to say. It's completely untrue. But at the same time, I was like, you know, I don't own my book. My book belongs to the readers, so they can interpret the way the way they want. So, yeah, I try to keep this thing mysterious. I think that in life, we don't have so much mysterious thing. It's like you are in love with someone and you try to keep it mysterious for a very, very, very long time. And I think the only field in my life where there is still a certain mystery is writing. I don't know why I do what I do. I don't know how I do it, uh, but I do it. <laughs> you know, tr translation is a tricky thing. I, I mean, I only read English, so I can't even comment about anything else. But here you are, you know, Madame Ambassador de la Langue Française, by the way, and in the British Library, and your books are in English. And I was saying to you backstage, you know, an instinct of mine is that, and I think this is probably always true, because Milan Kundera hates translations, but there's no way you can read him. Um, do you read them in translation? Yes, I do. And you know, I was, uh, those past months, I was the chair of the International Booker Prize. And it was very interesting because it's a prize that rewards the writer, but also the translator. So we had to be very aware of, of that, of the work of the, of the translator. And uh, sometimes I was reading the book in English and then read it in French, for example. And it's true that it's very, very different. It's, it's, Sometimes you feel that something is lost. Of course, something is lost. But also sometimes something is gained. Sometimes the translator is so good that the book is better in another language than in the... No, that's true. And it happened to me to read a book and to say, oh my God, you should have written it in English because really in Spanish it's not good. And uh, sometimes the translator is, is very good. So it's something quite magical, translation. I'm lucky because I can read my books in English, so in Arabic, in Spanish, and in Portuguese. So I can see what a translator can, can do. And um, I have to say that um, I'm really, really impressed by, by their work. And I'm really impressed by how much also, how, how much we can share of intimacy. Now they know me very well because my translator, Sam Teller, he translated all my work and my, translate, my German translator or my Spanish translator also, and they know everything about me. And with a translator, you, you share a lot of things. I remember that when we were translating Adele, my, my first novel, Sam Teller called me because it's a book about a woman who is a sex addict and you have a lot of sex scenes. And he called me and he said, you know, I have a problem from translating in, in English because in English you can't use the word sex for the genitals. In, in France you can, le sexe de l'homme, le sexe de la femme. So he said, we have to be more specific, so I have to ask you for each scene which word you want to use. 
and I was on speaker because I was writing and my husband was in, <laughs> in the room and he was hearing, so vagina or vulva? I was like, ah, vulva. And, that, and, he, and we spoke for like one hour about genitals and then we became very close friends and now we like each other very much. But just to say that he has to go very deep into your into your mind, into your obsession. And because I write a lot about the body, I think also, I don't know, there is something very intimate, very physical between uh, me and my translators. Because you are writing about the body and, and, and what happens with the body and to the body and of the body. Does anyone want to have any questions or while we pause for a minute? Now, don't be shy. Yes, say something. There's a mic coming. Um, I'll try and make this into a question. But um, I've only read um, Adele and Lullaby. Um, I, I really liked both of them. Um, I thought they were like really intense. But I was wondering, um, I, I read like um, there was an interview with you and you said how you think about ethnicity or race in French as opposed to English is quite different. You felt there was maybe more freedom if you think about it in English. Um, and I was just wondering, those were your first two novels, and now you're writing kind of stuff about, um, I guess, more personal, but also more what people might, quote unquote, expect from like a, an Arabic writer. So I was wondering, could you have, or would you have written this trilogy at the start? Or do you think you had to do those two books, which are, I think they're brilliant, by the way. But do you think um, you know you had to do those two books to be able to do this now? Yes, of course. That's a very good question. Um, I think that when I became a writer, I was very, very aware of what people were was expecting from me. You know, uh, a young girl from Maghreb writing novels. They want you first to be a victim. They want you to write about veil, about blood, about honor, about a bad brother or a bad father who is beating you, uh, probably about couscous and camels and things like that. And I didn't want to give them that because it was um, too easy and humiliating for me uh, in a way because I knew how they were going to look at me. So I wrote those two books, but it was strange also because many Many times people or journalists ask me, so yeah, it's very interesting. So you're writing about characters who are not Arabs. And I was like, yeah, and so what's the point? And it's really real as if I was supposed to write about people like me or people. And then in Lullaby, the main character, she is from Maghreb descent, but we don't really know from where, and it's not really important in, in the book. And she's a bourgeois, she's not poor, she's not a victim. And people were shocked by the fact that I was not representing the majority of people from Maghreb in France. But and you weren't vibrant enough. Yeah. Your vibrancy is one thing. But word. the truth is, I don't write to represent anyone. I don't work for a tourism agency. I don't care about the image of France or the image of Morocco, the image of, of myself. And um, I write to, uh, to provoke, I write to. Yeah, to be subversive, I don't want to please people or to be what they are expecting from me. I think that I was a very polite child, I was a very nice girl for many, many years and uh, I am polite in life, but when I write, I can be very rude and very impolite and do whatever I want, so that's why. <laughs> do you think that the French, you know, I hate this word, I mean, there is, can we have a mic? Ooh, it's so noisy. Can we have a mic here in this world? His hand is right there. Yeah, apologies for the noise, folks. We're just a, a large number of younger students, and they're just I on the way out for the day. Shut up. Oh, this is a piazza. I, I, I <laughs> I'm from Chicago. Don't let shut up. Um, just one question about the French market, that word. Is it more open for anybody to talk about sex? In a, in, it seems to me than the American and British market, for instance, that people are, I mean, they can read anything, but you have more of a, I don't know what we're gonna use, gateway. Yeah. The shock of you is the shock of you. 
But not the shock of what no, you No, no, not the shock of sex. In France, yeah. you can talk about sex yeah. all day long and no one will yeah, be nobody shocked. Cares. No, no, nobody cares. Nobody cares. shocking <laughs> no. here. Anyway, Albi. Yep. Hello. Um, I was at the last one for Lullaby. It's great that you're doing these books. Um, I have another way of ask, asking the same question. Um, James Baldwin, as you know, lived in Paris for nine years. Uh, Go Tate on a Mountain, Giovanni's Room in particular, came out of that life. Um, I'm wondering, since you spoke about being a Moroccan whose, whether it's second or third language is French, you chose to live in Paris. Um, you could have chosen to live in Brussels or anywhere in French Belgium, clearly Luxembourg or even in, in Switzerland. But the country that pulled you was the one that had been the colonizer. Um, the fact you're writing this particular story now, is it partly because of the 20 odd years that you've lived in Paris um, you have, let's say it's affected you emotionally, intellectually. Um, so even though you have this role as a representative of uh, literature, French literature, and you're not a, in the tourist aid department, as it were, it has nevertheless affected you. And you are telling stories that affect people. I mean, that time of 68 was, I'm, I'm 69 now, that time of 68 was very special to me, watching those students fighting the police, I thought, my gosh, this is the generation that's going to be in charge. We're going to have freedom. We're going to have real socialism everywhere. <laughs> that director, Richard Eyre, is going to be in charge, and he's going to open up everything for everybody. But no, Didn't David happen. Edgar's the one who told the truth. We all become Tory as we grow older, as it were, in this country, it seems. Okay? But my, <laughs> my question is really specifically about this effect of the country on you, and therefore your, what's drawing you to tell stories. Yeah, actually, I think now today I, I live in Portugal, I live in Lisbon, so I live between my two countries, one hour from Morocco, one hour from France. I think that the truth is I didn't find my place. In Morocco, I can't live, even if I love this country, but I can't live there because of the pressure of religion, because of uh, pressure on women. Uh, France, I spent 22 years in France, I lived in Paris, and it was beautiful. The first year was beautiful, I felt very free as a woman, as a writer, and um, you know there is this thing when you arrive in a very fancy, beautiful country, city like Paris, I, I wanted to, like in the Balzac novel, I wanted to be in, I wanted to belong, I wanted to succeed in Paris, it was like a challenge. And I made it, but once I made it, I understood also all the things I lost in, in the fight. You know, French are really obsessed with this idea of integration, assimilation. You have to assimilate yourself. You have to become a French. You have to forget about where you come from. And they're not interested in your stories of Absolutely Morocco and not. couscous and all this. You want to be French, be French. French, you like it or you live it. And so it was... At the end, you know, after 20 years, I was like, no, it's not really my place. So that's why I decided to write the trilogy, because I wanted to understand, but who am I? Because I am at the same time the daughter of a French woman and of a Moroccan uh, guy. I, am, I belong to a monarchy and to a republic. I belong to a country where religion is very important and to a republic where laïcité is very important. I belong to a very poor country where 50% uh, of uh, women can't read or write and to a very powerful country in terms of culture and literature that is France. So how, do you, how does it work? You have contradiction all the time. You know, when I am in France and people um, criticize Morocco about things or that, it makes me very angry and I say, no, that's not true. But if I go to Morocco and someone tells me that this is not true, I say, yes, it's true. So you, you never know on which side you are. And um, I think I wanted to try to understand and maybe forgive myself and find a place for me. And that's why the title is of the whole trilogy is The Country of Others. Because I always lived in the country of others. Um, I've never felt that I belong. And it's not a problem now. Now I understand that I'm not this kind of person who belongs, who has a real place, who has roots. I am a nomad. I am going from one place to another. And now I understand that my home is the body of people I love. 
my, the body of my children, it's my home, it's my homeland, and that's the place where I want to be, is the place where they are. That's the only thing that matters to me. But it took me two books to understand that, that maybe your roots are where the people you love are. And also to, to embrace discomfort, yeah. because we're not in an age where people are want to be uncomfortable. Everyone's seeking and a safe space. And nuance and complexity. Space. That exactly. Complex. And they're, yeah. you know, they're seeking these safe spaces. Um, Albie, just talk about Jimmy Baldwin for a minute. He, uh, I'm working on a book about That's him. That's funny, we were talking about yes, him. Just yeah, before. about Baldwin. It's interesting you say this. That's the most American thing he did. You know, only an American would think that they could go somewhere and be something else. That's very American. And I think he saw that in the end, that going to Paris is an American response <laughs> to that trauma that he suffered, because I went to Paris too, as all black Americans do. I don't know what we thought was there, but we went. And to think you could go and be there and be accepted is also the divide between yeah. black American Parisians and everybody else of African descent. And sometimes we don't know that. You know, we don't know that because we're in this world that's kind of a, a bubble. And France, Paris actually encourages it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wants it to happen. Because under the Constitution of France, there is only a French person. There isn't anything else. And if you don't want to be that, you, you, there's no, there's very little space for you. You have to constantly keep making your space. Is, is any, any, any other questions? Anyone else? Or thoughts? Or comments? <laughs> I should also mention to those watching online, please do put questions in the, uh, in the form below the video. We can read them out. Anyone in house? No. Okay. Then I'm going to say something. How, the act of writing, writing fiction in particular, is a constant breaking into the world, unless you write pulp, you know, it's a lot of people just, you know, and they make a lot of money, unfortunately, but you, did, did I ask you this? I think I did. Did fiction choose you? I think and, so. and when you talk about, you know, growing up and looking at the movies, is that's part of it, did fiction choose you? Yes, I think so, but you have also to make yourself uh, ready for it, to accept it. And um, yeah, it chose me, but I choose it also. It's uh, uh, a love that is, is shared, it's on, on, on both sides. Um, it's very difficult also to live in fiction all the time. You know, I, I spend, la now I'm writing the third part of the, of the trilogy and it's, I spend like, 10, 11 hours per day thinking about people who don't exist and I'm obsessed with them and for me sometimes they are much more important than yes. people who exist yes. and I know that for my children or for people who live with me it's very very difficult and the more I write and the more I'm involved in literature and the more this uh, frontier, this boundary between real life and fiction becomes, is moving. And I think that I spend, yeah, the majority of much of my time in fiction and in reality. I, I love this paragraph in Watch Us Dance. I mean, it made me actually laugh out loud because uh, of his irony, but also it's, it's fucking true. It says, it is unbelievable. This is one of the characters talking. It is unbelievable. The country is on the verge of revolution. The people are living in poverty. And Monsieur Roland Barthes is going to pay us the honor of teaching us Proust and Racine. What the hell do Moroccans care about Proust? We wear your clothes, we listen to your music, we watch your films. In the cafes of Casablanca, young people read Le Mans and bet on horse racing in Paris. When are we going to understand that we need to develop our own personality, understand our own culture, take control of our own destiny. And that is the kind of clarion call, not only to a nation, but to an individual. 
your own destiny. Yeah, absolutely. Take over your own destiny. And it's the end of the 60s and that people should not forget that it's not because colonization ended that it's the end of being colonized. You know, my father, he always told me that it was maybe worse in the 60s or the 70s than before because so many um, influ cultural influence and imperialism also coming also from, from America. So people in Algeria, in Morocco, and in whole Africa were always looking outside and it, they didn't take time to define themselves. And those who tried were killed. Most of them, the Patrice de Mumba, the Mehdi Bembarka, all those men who believed that they needed to define themselves and to find a real, yeah, a way for, for them that were killed by the, the power. And then Baldwin was killed in a way too, yeah. because he sought to define himself in an era where, at least in, in the United States, we were starting to consolidate around categories and names, and Jimmy didn't fit in any of those. And he got crunched, he got smashed, he got erased. That was a very violent period also. Absolutely. People forget about that because it was not only about sex, drug, and rock and roll, it was yeah. a lot of extremely violence. Violent. Yeah, extremely violent. Extremely violent. And I think now we, you know, we look at Morocco, we look at a Baldwin, we look even at yourself and we, don't know or we forget uh, the tumult of that time because now there are three generations that are born after that and all that they see is, you know, the who, uh, or, or, you know, the hippie trail, the Beatles, yeah. you know, hair, all of that. But it was a time when nations were not only being formed, they were being destroyed and people were being destroyed as well um, who were very much a part of that. Yeah, that's, that's what I try to. And that's what you have in Watch Us Dance and why I say, in a way, when I love the title because I, in the rest of it, I feel like saying, yes, watch us dance at the end of a rope, yeah. watch us dance on the head of a pin, watch us dance on the world. Does anyone have any other feelings, comments, thoughts? Yes, here's some, in the, there's a person. Thank you. Love your work. Um, following you. on from your sort of previous comments of like Lullaby and Adele enabled you to write, sort of open the door in order for you to introduce this trilogy. Do you feel like you have almost like um, it's resolved something or is it like a catharsis? And, and sort of where do you see your next sort of after the trilogy is completed? Are you able to think past your third book or, or what's the sort of process? So, yeah, thank you for the question. First, it didn't resolve anything. It made everything worse. So. <laughs> It was not really a good idea. The catharsis didn't work at all. Uh, so now it's it's a mess because I discovered also a lot of things. And um, we were speaking about complexity and I discovered how complex everything was for my parents, for my grandparents. And uh, now that I am a mother myself, an adult myself, I'm facing actually sometimes the same challenges. So no, it, make it, it made it worse. And then, no, I don't really imagine what I'm going to do after, but I know that I'm going to pose in terms of writing novels because I, I wrote like five novels, I wrote um, graphic novels, I wrote uh, essays, nonfiction, and I am very tired. I think I need a big break. <laughs> I need some time for me. I need to be able to to live, uh, and when I say to live, I mean not to live all day long with books, not reading all the time and not writing all the time. So yeah, I will try to do something really new for me, which is live. Uh, can I ask the audience a question? Because, and I think I, I know Leila well enough, I think she would be okay with this question, but even if she isn't, I'm going to ask. <laughs> I never go to hear writers talk. So I'm interested in why you all are here. Because I think in a way, there's something that's not being said or not being articulated. And I would, I'm desperate to know why you come to the library. Yes, sir. Oh, we need a mic. Let me get your mic. Let me get your mic. The 
main reason why I came today is because some t why, why I come to talks with writers is mainly because how you see it might not be the way they see it. So your interpretation might be totally incorrect. The other reason is also that I spent a lot of time reading. Can it be incorrect? It can be incorrect. What the way how I see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can be incorrect, but it okay. can be correct too. So okay. it might confirm something. Okay. But at the same time, even if it does confirm something, don't generalize something because yes. it might be a different experience for somebody else. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Really. So you you come for because you have a question, you have something that you, is not yeah, clarification in it or yeah, clarification, yes, but also to see yeah. like um, I remember seeing the you watching and writing and you're doing that. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's really good. Anyone else want to out themselves? Sorry. Yes, there's someone in the back. <laughs> Hello, I'm, I'm a drama teacher and I just love different voices and I think it's really interesting when you come to something new, hear the perspective of someone writing, um, you get opened into different worlds. It's also work with lots of children, so I like hearing about filth and <laughs> violence and things like that because I don't have to always do that at work. It's just a really different experience. You don't Excellent. Um, Excellent. always have that perspective when you're in your own space. Excellent. And so you just hear lots of different perspectives. It's nice. Excellent. Excellent. I love that. And yeah, it's beautiful, this idea that it's you beautiful. want to have another yes. point beautiful. of view. Yeah. It's beautiful. We have an online question from Jose. Yes, okay. um, who would like to know, living in a third country, Portugal, does it help you see Morocco and France more clearly? Um, I don't know because um, I feel a lot of nostalgia and I don't know if uh, nostalgia is something that helps you see things clearly. Um, I don't really believe that it's possible to see things clearly, especially things that you love and things that matters to you. You don't see it clearly, you see it through a feeling, through nostalgia or through regret or through the fact that you miss uh, someone or a place. So, no, I don't think so, but um, it helps me um, find some peace uh, and uh, this is a very interesting country i live in lisbon and lisbon is really really at the end of the world the end of europe it's really really far it's the oldest city in europe yeah as well. exactly and uh it's a city where uh, arabs lived for centuries so in some part of the of, of the city some streets i have the feeling that i am in tangier or in rabat and at the same time it's very european so it's a mix of my two culture and I like it, I like it very much. And yeah, I, I love the language also, I love the culture, I love the Sudan. Uh, it's very melancholic and you I am You are a nomad too. Yeah, I am a nomad. Yeah. I mean, you are a nomad. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you, when you read the fiction, you have a feeling that you, at some point there's going to be another place. I've always traveled a lot. I've always traveled a lot. And I remember that my, my mother always told me, but why are you so obsessed with traveling? What are you escaping? And actually, I was not escaping nothing, but I wanted just, you know, to have stamps on my passport. I wanted to go from one place to another. I lived in Budapest. I lived in Vienna. I lived in Paris. I lived in, in New York. And um, no, I love, I love that. I love the fact of being a foreigner. And I love also not understanding the language. I love that you said that because I love being a foreigner too. I love. I you love know, you, when you sit on a, on a terrace in a city that you don't know, and you hear people having conversation in a language that you don't understand, and you try to figure out: Are they friends or sisters? I love being what are they sharing? Is yeah. it about love? Is it about work? And I love that because you you observe and you become more vigilant, and, and you don't know that you what know they're you, talking you, about. Yeah. You know, not only the language, but even if you're in the in a culture that has the same language you don't know what they're talking about you know and it's something that's very exciting actually it's very exciting and everything can happen in a yeah, place where well, no what one is knows that about yeah. Albie. Going back to your question Bonnie why do I go well you've known me for a long time um, I go because I want to connect with someone else's voice um, to understand where that person is coming from and that's partly because I work in the field of film and, and television drama and theatre. I have always done that. And the written word, the, the examination of human nature, 
relationships, the problems we have, how we deal with things, but clearly being a black person born in this country, there has been this other dimension which I am interested to know how people who are visible minorities, as you call us, um, we now have another term we're using since BLM, saying of the global majority yeah. of people, to see how far we are managing to move our stories forward and to connect with other people and if it's really working, what we're trying to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you beautiful. for that. Yeah. All of the comments are beautiful. Anybody else? I mean, you know, it's, you come out for some, you know, I'm saying I, I, that interests me and I'd like to know more myself. If you can say it, I mean, it's probably. This year, I decided to read your book, Whilst I was on the holiday in Montserrat, and I deliberately decided to read your book because I wanted to move away from a lot of Caribbean writing and a lot of Caribbean diasporic writing. You're saying you want to? I, I wanted for a little bit. I, I always go back. I I'm, not, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not escaping yeah, from yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, my question was, you talked about the stereotypes. So in Caribbean writing, there's normally a, a stereotype of someone goes to New York, someone goes to London, someone migrates somewhere, and you wanted to escape the stereotypes. But you see constant Caribbean novels like that, but they're still good because they know how to write. Did you really have to fight internally to move away from those stereotypes? Because maybe you had experienced that a number of times, or were you just, did you just feel completely free to re re write the story that you wanted to write? No, you know, you can also play with stereotypes. You can also try to do something with them because life is full of cliché. Um, even if we think that we can escape from cliché, we all have clichés in, in our head, in, our, uh, in the vision we have of, of the world. But I think that what is important when you write is to be aware of the fact that it is a cliché. What, what am I going to do with this? And sometimes you can play with it. I, myself, as a person, I play with the cliché that I know people think about me. And sometimes I, it can be funny also. You can have some irony. I think it, it's important also not to take everything too seriously, to be able also to have a certain distance with things and to be able to laugh about things. You know, when people have cliché about the fact that I'm Moroccan, you know, in, in France, for instance, when you say uh, I'm from Morocco, very often the person in front of you is going to answer, oh, yeah, interesting, you know, my stepfather went in Tunisia like in 82, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I don't care. Or, oh, yeah, I love couscous. I don't care either. So uh, you can be angry and you can, but uh, I choose to laugh about it and to try to explain to the, the, the French person in, in front of me that it, he, he wouldn't like if each time he say, I'm French, the person in front say, oh, j'adore le camembert. Or, <laughs> you know, it's exactly the same. So you just have to try to explain things, I, I think. Um, and when it comes to literature, to try to make it, yeah, to, to use it uh, for the sense of humor. Can I say quickly also that what you're also talking about is the publishing industry, because a lot of people yeah. are doing things, but only certain things sometimes, I'm talking about in this country, get through. So you could be writing something that's completely different about being who you are, but if somebody on the other side of that desk doesn't recognize it, doesn't give you a shot, then we get the same cookie cutter stuff, and, and that's part of it, and I hope you are writing different things, I'm sure you are. Um, do we have any? Yes. Oh, oops, 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 yes. Hi. I'll try to be quick. Um, you don't have you, to, do you? You were talking about the, how the memory of your parents had to do with a lot of dancing, and the dancing had to do with the hope and the feeling that things were going to be better in the future. And I couldn't help but remember that in Chile, the latest uh, protests became very famous because the women decided to protest dancing. Yes. And this is also used against Brazilians. I'm from Brazil. People say that we can't protest because we are always smiling and dancing and doing carnival and then it's not a real protest. So I just wanted to ask you to talk a, a little more about um, this emotional aspect of dance has been part of the revolution, like the quote says that if there is no dance, it's not my revolution, and if it influenced your choice for a title. If we, do, if we can't dance, don't invite me to the revolution. 
<laughs> Obrigada. Um, yes, of course, I think, you know, I think that joy is a protest. And for this generation, it was. Uh, you have to imagine that Morocco in the 50s or the 60s, it was quite, I don't know how to say in English, in French, it's austere. Mm -hmm. It was quite sad. And a woman is supposed to act like this. Conservative. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Conservative. A woman acts like this and uh, a man like that. Very often they were separated for parties, for marriage, for things like that. Women on one side, men on the other side. In the generation of my parents, for the first time, you have young people who look at their parents and they say, no, I'm not going just to work and to stay at home and to eat and sleep. I want to dance. I want to, I want to have pleasure. I want to spend time smoking and drinking and doing nothing. For my grandfather, I remember my grandfather, when he was looking at us, dancing, he couldn't understand. For him, we, was, we were just wasting time because life was about work and work and work and family and that's it. You were not supposed to waste time in the cafe, waste time listening to music or um, uh, buying a nice dress because you, want to, because you want to dance. So I think that joy, expression of the body, but also dance is also about sensuality. You dance with someone. You dance because you want someone to look at you dancing and you want to look at someone dancing. And that's why there is this title watch us dance, because there is also a provocation, watch us, we're young, we're beautiful, and we are dancing, and we know that things are happening around us, we know that life is difficult and that people are suffering, but anyway, we are dancing, and it's something also I try to transmit to my children, there is a certain um, bravery, a certain courage in being joyful, in dancing, in continuing to believe that there is some joy and that the happy days will, will come back. I think that this depression that we are all experiencing right now in Europe, this idea that no one wants to dance anymore, it's also something very dangerous politically. Absolutely. I think that we have to fight, to find in ourselves this energy to dance again. Because if we don't, there are other people who will take advantage of this apathy, of this sadness. Sadness is, is dangerous, it's I austere, think. austere, this air, this austere, this deep conservatism that has permeated the culture on all spectrums, yeah. which is really... No, very rigid and you have to be here. And when you dance, we dance together. When yes. you go to a nightclub, you don't ask the person, where are you from and what is your social class and how much do you earn? No, you dance. The first thing is you dance. And then you will discuss and discover and maybe the boundaries will come back. But dancing is something very collective. I think we have to stop now. Uh, we've got one more question? Two more. Oh, two more. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your honesty earlier because it was something that resonated with me when you said you felt torn between two cultures and um, sometimes I've, I've lived here all my life but I've gone, I've, my family's from Ghana and my dad very much identifies me as a, a, a Ghanaian, he's with Ghan and my husband's very much, no you're English, you don't, you don't even live there, blah 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 and I've constantly felt myself torn and a bit I don't know, not, not like a liar, but I can't necessarily be honest about one because I'll go to one place and I'll immediately feel like an alien. Um, and now I'm the mother of a daughter and I have this guilt where I feel like I can't help her get over that because I'm not over it myself. And I just feel like as a mother of maybe children who where they see you are from different places, how do you help them almost not settle but feel comfortable with all those narratives? First, um, uh, it was very important for me that they learn as many languages as possible. Uh, my children, they speak Arabic, French, English, and Portuguese fluently. And so I think it helps them very much to open their mind. My children, they feel good anywhere. They, you can take them, you know, my, my son, he traveled with me since he was like two months, and he went everywhere with me. So 
as long as there is food, because he's just obsessed with food, as long as there is food, it's his place, and he belongs, he doesn't care. Um, and my daughter is, is the same. And um, I think I just try to, yeah, to tell them that you can find your place anywhere as soon as you are respectful, as soon as you observe, as soon as you try to understand where you are and try to respect the way people behave and the way of life in different places. And, you know, you can't, um, every child and every person will have his own journey. I, I have my own problems and I know that my children will have, and um, I'm not trying to protect them all the time. Um, I know that some of my friends are very shocked by the education I give to my children because I talk with them of everything. I show them very shocking movies and I give them very shocking books. But maybe it's a mistake, but I think that my job as a mother is not to tell them that everything is beautiful and that they live in a bubble. My job is to, tell, to tease them and to tell them, look at this, look how, sometimes how beautiful, but look also how ug ugly, and I want to have a discussion with, with you about this. I think that uh, children can understand anything as long as you sit next to them and you talk, and you explain, and I'd rather be the one to explain to them than the internet or whatever. So, yeah, I talked with them of everything. One more, I think. Um, I, I was just curious about what you said about um, your work in translation. Um, I was just curious, what, is, what were your first two books like when you read them in English compared to the, the French, like the original version? Uh, and also, would you consider writing a book um, in a language other than French? Um, I don't really remember for the two books. I think the first one that was translated was Lullaby. And uh, um, because the style of Lullaby is very, you know, it's very, um, in French we would say dry, very sick. Um, I think it was, Sam Taylor was the perfect translator for it. So when I read it in English for the first time, it seemed like I was reading my book. Um, it felt very familiar to me. I didn't feel betrayed by the, the translation. And actually, yes, I would love to write in another language. I would love to write in English, and I would love to write in Portuguese. Portuguese is really beautiful, very poetic, and I love the rhythm of the, of the phrase. And um, uh, we have a Bra Brazilian here. Brazilian is even more beautiful than, than Portuguese mm -hmm. because of the, the rhythm and the way they, they talk. So yeah, I would like one day to write in Portuguese. And I love the concept of Brazilian concept of saudade, you know, that beautiful sort of longing for... Yeah, that's the Portuguese. Is, I love that. I love saudade. And when you that's live in beautiful. Lisbon in the winter, I can tell you that you understand what is the saudade. It's beautiful. When you have the, the Atlantic Ocean and the, the... Oh my God, and it's cold and it's raining and everyone is like this. You're like, oh yeah, now I know what is saudade. <laughs> can, I, can I wrap it up by saying that... Um, you evoke Glissant, Edouard Glissant, and Poetics of Relation. I hope people become familiar. He's very dense, but his, his theories, great from Martinique, was from Martinique, great poet, mm -hmm. great uh, thinker. His theory was, in French, créolisation, the idea of what Leila's books are. It's about mixture. It's about the fact that there isn't a root. There are lots of roots. That those roots can lead to other roots and other spaces. And listening to you today and engaging with the audience, even for me in some way, gave me glissant in, in very much his incredible clarification of the human being. And we're talking about human beings. And Lily, you write about human beings. And I think that's the highest accolade that any writer, that I would give any writer. And I thank you for being with thank us. Thank you. Tonight. Thank you so much. And I thank you all for coming out. Thank you very much. Tonight. Merci beaucoup. And all of you have a lovely evening. There are books, and there's Lila to talk to. And, and dancing. And dance, and dance, and dance. Please dance. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Bye. And thank online. You. Thank you. Online as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.